that we ever had it at Lockheed for the years that I was there, which is a long time. It was a very safe operation. And of course, the safety is in the hands of the people that made the airplanes and put them together and, mm -hmm. and checked them. But of course, of course, we we solved a lot of problems. Flight operations. We solved a lot of problems before it got in the air. We did a thorough pre-flight, and when anything we found wrong, we write up squawks. And uh, I can remember when the the B-47 was pretty well established. By the time I got there, and there wasn't much many squawks on it, but not 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 very many of the first flights on the airplane would be bought as we said if an airplane was 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 okay we'd buy it and turn it over to the Air Force they would fly it and do the same thing so that not many of them were bought on the first flight we had to fly two or three four flights to write it get all the squawks fixed and try it again and be sure they're okay but when the C-130 came along and the Lockheed uh, plant up there was learning how to build it and everything when we first got the C-130s, we had most C-130s, average C-130s, would be pre-flighting in pre-flight status and being pre-flighted by us. Well, I need to tell you another story. This, in, Lockheed has production and inspection, another department. Production builds it, inspection inspects it, and says everything's okay. Then they turn it over to flight operations. And flight operations then First C-130s, we had usually an average of 700 squawks that we found, 700 items that we found wrong on the airplane. On every airplane? Every airplane, average for first couple of years, really. Before you even flew it? Yeah, just before from we ground thought check. about flying it. That's what we did. We had to fly it eventually, but we weren't going to fly it till it was right, and we get all these things, and we had all these things corrected to our satisfaction, we'd pre-flight again, and we'd get a pre-flight complete with enough things that were not related to flight or they were not dangerous to flight, then we'd fly it and we started writing again. We had a hundreds more squawks in the air and get all those fixed and fly it again, fly it again. We flew C 130s a lot of times each in those days. But when I, I got to be C 130 project pilot after I'd been a Lockheed about 10 years, and by then we were getting C 130s that so would have a, our first pre flight, we'd get maybe 50 squawks and mm -hmm. Flights would get maybe 10 or something like that, so they improved greatly as it went along. Wow. I always thought it was wonderful, but mighty slow. Yeah. It, was, it was like any big business, I guess. It was awful hard to get a message, get something fixed, and, and if you fix today, another airplane comes along, why did they correct that in there? Well, they tried, but and they just didn't get the message somehow. It'd take a long time, be years later. I remember one event along that line that happened when a C-141 came along, the first thing that happened was that the seniority system gives this worker the right to, to if he's senior, he gets to work on wherever he wants. And so the senior people immediately all transferred over to the 141 production line instead of the C-130. B-47 was gone by now. And so all these people transferred, the C-130 had got down to very few squawks, as I said, like 100 to something like that, and the 141 coming, all these people went over here, and so the new people were on the C-130, and so all of a sudden down here we get, this airplane came through, and we had maybe 10 total squawks on it, it looked in really good shape, next airplane came through, 800 squawks again, after all those people changed over, they all had a whole new set of people in the plant, they had to learn to do the job again, and a new, new set of people had to learn to correct them, it was just so wasteful, Stupid, but that's the best you can do in a 60,000 people plant, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so then the, the uh, C-130 started ramping up, and what was your involvement in that? Well, when it first came out... And how did you get into it? When it first came out, it was built in California, designed and built in California. If you read Lockheed's book, Kelly Johnson, had a hand in designing the C-130. Kelly Johnson had a hand in designing the C-130. He was the chief engineer at that time, design engineer. But there was another guy, and I can't remember now, he's one of Lockheed's famous people, I just can't remember the name, as well as Kelly Johnson, actually designed the airplane. But Kelly Johnson, when they built it, the first one, the prototype, he looked at it and said, that's the ugliest airplane I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he really ran it down, which is not to his credit, because it turned out today 
to be one of the well the longest lived and production airplane ever been built. Yeah. Just a wonderful airplane every Still way. Still in production. But it didn't it didn't start out that way. He Kelly Johnson didn't like it anyhow. But anyhow they built the they built the first prototype in California and then built another one for two and by then management decided to build the production put the production to build them in Marietta. So they flew the the two prototype airplanes to Marietta. So we had the two prototype airplanes and my involvement became I was assigned to fly the first one of the two prototypes early on and um, I didn't I not as pilot, I was co pilot. My friend Lloyd Harris was a pilot and I'd fly with him most of the time. And so I started flying a C one thirty in that manner with him and that was just a demonstration like you said, using the airplane around there to to get some experience on it and learn how to operate and everything. And then uh, one of the things that happened about that time was Lockheed and the Air Force decided that, that one of the purposes of C-130 was to be able to drop large cargo items in the air as well as land them and, and unload them and everything. So and I believe it was about six months after we got the first time they scheduled the called the drop test at El Centro, California, and I was assigned to go along with with Warren Lee who was the pilot on that airplane, and I was a co-pilot. And uh, Warren Lee was one of the old SAC pilots at Lockheed, been there a long time before me. And uh, Jack Gilly was another name involved in this. He was a flight engineer on that airplane, and he was he had transferred to Marietta from from California Lockheed. He'd been involved with the C-130 all the time, so he was very familiar with it. And so that was those those are three I remember on the crew. And another one that went on the trip, but wasn't really a member of the crew, was Chuck Mahoy, who was an Allison employee, and he was uh, responsible for care of the engines on this, this new prototype C-130. They were the only ones they had, those that set of engines. So he was to making sure they we took care of them. And I don't remember who else was on that trip. Anyhow, we left Lockheed one day and headed to El Centro with that new C-130. And it was 27 days later we got to El Centro. <laughs> it, was, it was the trip itself was a, a book worth of interesting events. Only a few stick in mind. One of them was that along the way, after a lot of trouble we'd had one time, we were flying along and Jack Gilly was the engineer sitting in the middle there and I was sitting in the co-pilot seat and he was saying to me, he said, boy, you're a lucky young man. You're flying here in a new quality airplane built by Lockheed and you got the world's most experienced flight crew here. Myself and Warren Lee here, we just got all the experience in the world. We know everything. And uh, to end that story without telling you how it got that way, the next thing that happened, we landed that thing in Big String, Texas with three engines out, shut down, and one engine running. And I, after I landed, somehow the conversation got around to me, an opportunity for me to say to Jack Gilly, I said, is that the way the most experienced flight crew in the world always <laughs> operates, shut down three engines? They had had fire warning lights on the two outboard engines and shut them down when there really wasn't any fire. And then they had two engines running and they, somebody, I don't remember who said, there's low oil pressure on number two and we've got to shut it down. And I experienced flight engineer Jack Gilly shut down number three. And it was number three and two that had low oil pressure. Oh no. So we ended up with only number two engine running and it had low oil pressure and landed in big spring. Of course that wasn't any problem with all that. That was excitable at the moment and pretty stupid, but could you maintain was, altitude with one engine? Huh? Could it maintain altitude with oh, one yeah. engine? Yeah. Easy. Really? The only fear was once you had four, you want four. That's the only thing that goes wrong. Yeah, I had several experiences with the C-130 C in production flight test. I had to shut down two or three engines because of difficulties with the engines or something wrong. I remember one case, I was only about five minutes from the field to the north and the engineer in the back called out those big liquid coming out of the right wing. C-130. It just barely got off and turned north and a little bit north of the field and the engineer in the back called out fluid running out of the right wing and not anything fluid in there except with fuel. So we took another, got everybody to go back there and look, be sure that's what it was. 
by then it was really streaming out of there, a big stream of fuel running out of the right wing all the way down trailing edge, running out to the tip and off. And uh, so we shut down both the engines on that side, and turned off everything electrical we could, and went straight back to the field and landed. There wasn't any problem though, it's just that it might have been if we didn't had put it off or something. But in that case, it ended up we landed in the middle of the runway and called Dobbins Tower and said, we're landing, but we're going to leave the airplane sitting where it lands, so you can come get it. I called Lockheed and tell them to come get it. So we landed in the middle of the runway at Dobbins and opened the door and everybody jumped out and we ran to the flight line and <laughs> left it sitting out in the middle of the runway. Hmm. But, you know, things like that were, I guess you won't say common, but they were events like that. You had to, something came up, you had to do the right thing pretty quick. I remember one time landing a ski airplane. One of the things we would do is see when 30s would practice, do the ILS practice. I'd do one ILS and check out the ILS equipment. We'd go to Chattanooga, about 100 miles north of Atlanta, to do that. It wasn't congested up there. And we had a, a ski ski C-130. I've forgotten what the designation is, Lockheed designation. But anyhow, it has skis on the wheels and you can head control panel, you could lift the skis up, land on the wheels, or you could put the skis down, put the wheels down, then put the skis down below that, and land on the skis. But anyhow, we landed up at Chattanooga, and touch and go on an ILS, and when we landed up there, one of the skis on the right side lost hydraulic pressure and just dropped down, was dragging on the ground, sparks flying out the back end like it was a big fire there, you know. Then we shut that one down and left it sitting right there, and Called Lockheed on the phone and said, send a car up here and get us, your airplane's up here. <laughs> <laughs> we went back the next day and got it. They sent somebody up there to fix it. The uh, I, You actually did demo flights on the C-130 though, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You demoed uh, the JATO? No, I didn't ever demo, demo the JATO on the 130. I did on the B-47. Every 10th airplane on the B-47 had a JATO, had yeah. to do a JATO. The uh, I thought it, there's a book about the Hercules that you got. I need to get for you. We got a couple of them, and um, and it talks about you in that book. And I thought they were talking about how the guy always liked to go with you when you were doing the jet. You were doing the short. Oh, just short takeoff and landings. I guess it was. There was no J. May, may have been. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that, that was a local newspaper editor, and and I think he was just inexperienced to the point. He thought that was. Pretty spectacular, so mm -hmm. we were demonstrating a little bit, you might say, just yeah. for him. But okay. Nothing special. Every every takeoff and land in C-130 is very short. Mm -hmm. It was a very good short field airplane. The original C-130 with the three blade electric props later had four blade Hamilton standard props. The original C-130 was the lightest airplane and the sh slowest and shortest landing and takeoff airplane of all the C-130s that have been made since then. Mm. Today they're flying a C-130H, which is a much, almost a new airplane. It's so different and it's a lot heavier. Uh, I've forgotten the number. It's like 20, 30,000 pounds heavier than the first one. Mm. But the one of the things about a turbine engine like that, it's got a fuel control that senses low RPM and feeds its own fuel regardless of where they got the power lever. Mm. So in the air with that airplane, you could slow it down to about 65 knots, which is amazing for such a big airplane. Mm -hmm. And it's flying fine. And if you get a little bit slower than 65, the fuel control the engine start feeding fuel down and it start picking up speed again. Mm -hmm. And you throttle it all the way back, nothing you can do about it till you pick up more speed again. Mm -hmm. So all the C-130s are quite different, but short field was, you might say, their, their nature. That's one of the advantage of the airplane that has short rough field capability. So your main uh, position then was still a production test pilot on the 130 then? Yes. Mm -hmm. My title at Lockheed was never anything else. 